Hey everybody, Jonathan Mark Mendes, Painted Love, and welcome to my channel. Today I take another revisited look at one of my old Academy tutorials. Now this was Build Faded Grandeur, and the reason I called it Faded Grandeur was I was looking for some words that would describe a piece of furniture that looked as if it dropped out of a chateau or a palazzo, something with real natural age and patina over the test of time. Now this is a look that really sits well with my style. It's probably um, a finish that I'm most commonly known for, although I do many different things with paint, as you will have seen. You can even see behind me, lots of different things going on with paint. But this is a look that I love and it sits really beautifully with me. This is just one side of faded grandeur. There is many other aspects to it. So I will show you those in time, but this will give you the basis of how to get a great look on an old piece of furniture. So sit back, enjoy the tutorial. I will see you on the other side. Where to start with your faded grandeur project? Firstly, I would say choose a piece of furniture with great bones, kind of curvy, romantic in its shape. Now today I am actually working on a beautiful old Victorian piece of furniture. Ordinarily, I would say go for something reproduction. There's many styles out there that are in the same sort of style, but this piece I stumbled across very cheaply. It was not without its flaws. As you can see, I've had to do a bit of work on filling and sanding pre-filming. There was lots of veneer missing. It also had a section of woodworm, which I've treated and plenty of bits of veneer um, off, which not all of them that I fixed, I'm allowing them to speak freely with the paint. Also, I'm taking note pre-painting of the natural fadage of all of the different timbers on this piece of furniture. I'm using it kind of inspiration. The inset panels of veneer are much darker than the actual mahogany wood around the edges, which I do like, but I think I'm gonna reverse that around and make the outside edges darker and the internal panels a little bit lighter. And the palette that I've chosen to go with is um, olive um, and uh, chateau grey for the light because it's very similar in tone. But we're going to put a base coat of Paris grey because I want to chip back and get those natural sort of light tones as if it's had years of paint on the piece. So that's where we're going to go. Beyond that, I don't know. I'm gonna, you're going to join this journey with me because sometimes I, I just don't know where the piece is going to go. So we're going to, you're going to see this evolve with me. Um, we may use some fly spec um, to add some sort of patina. We may use en fleur and, and push into the corbels and add depth. But for now, let's get cracking with the Paris Grey. I'm going to work into the detail first. And with the Paris Grey, um, all I'm going to do is add lots of dimension and texture into the paint because when we do some sort of wet distressing technique, we want it to pull back in an un un uneven way. So all I'm doing is kind of cross hatching my, pa uh, my paintbrush strokes. And I'm allowing some areas to be slightly thicker than others. Um, so, and I'm not particularly too bothered about um, get, getting paint everywhere because this is merely the base coat. So we just want flecks of this to come through. And it is always very sad to see such a beautiful piece of wood vanish under paint, but we're gonna make it so beautiful that you'll forget about the wood and you'll enjoy the paint. So have some conviction and enjoy painting, because I do. Here we have it. The Paris Grey looks amazing, which I thought it would, but that's not where we start. We're gonna move forward and add lots of patina to this. So as you can see, we've also got some bleed through with the Paris Grey and I quite like it and it's, it's inspired me a little bit to try to make these panels a little bit blended. So 
what I'm going to do is I've got my um, tones on a plate because I don't want to contaminate the, the can. So we're going to go with the Paris Grey and the Chateau Grey and mix them together to get a real soft sort of um, washy tone on, on the piece. So here goes. Let's, let's try a little bit. So we're going to add um, the Chateau Grey just into the insert straight over the Paris Grey. And I'm not going to worry about this line, I'm just going to go over the top because we're going to do these olive, so we'll, we'll work a little bit more, we'll tidy it all up at the end. So, just get some paint into these areas, which is lovely, I love this colour. Again, any what way, just make sure you get into those detailed edges. So now I'm going to pick up a little bit of Paris Grey and just add a bit of Paris Grey to get sort of some tone. So it's like cloud-like. Whilst the, whilst the paint's still wet, we're adding another colour, so we're getting a mixture of tone. So it's soft. I'm not going to do everywhere, just a few little patches here and there. And I quite like that. So it's a little bit tone on tone, and it's good. I feel comfortable with that. And then we'll add the, the darker olive. We're going to repeat the process. I'm going to carry on this area. So I've decided lighter, lighter, darker, 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 darker. The same on the other side. Lighter, lighter, darker, darker around the frames. So I'll carry on with the process and then when we hit the olive we'll have another look at how I'm going to work around that part. I'm going to do the same thing again but I'm not going to worry too much about making it an exact copy of the other side because I want this to be, again, organic um, and it, it needs to be slightly different. So we will do it a little bit different. We'll just allow the paint to do what it needs to do. Um, so we're going to add this quick. The beauty is because we've already got Paris grey underneath, I don't have to worry too much how perfect it is. So I'm quite happy with that as a tone, it feels good to me and we're going to carry along the top as we said, we're going to work all the way around this top perimeter and then we're going to go back in with the olive and I think what we might do with the olive, we'll add a little bit of the chateau to the olive to uh, lighten the olive up with the chateau. So that's where I'm aiming, um, keep on watching the process and then you'll see how it comes to life. I'm super pleased with the blending, so now we're going to go for the olive. And I did think I might blend some colours into the olive as well, but for, for the time being, just to make life a lot easier, I'm going to paint out all of the remainder just with a flat coat of olive and then work out. I'm not too sure whether I will blend it, but it will it'll come to me as I'm going. I'm pretty sure that we might wet distress the edges to bring back some of the Paris Grey and we won't distress too much internal of these panels because they'd be the pieces of the furniture that would be least worn. It'd always be round the edges. So that's why I'm thinking a bit of wet distress, chippy break back down to the wood. So here goes, let's get some olive on. And what I'm gonna do is work up to um, the line of this door and we're just going to work around very neatly well I say neatly you can go over the edge I'm not going to worry about that because when we distress it's going to come come back to wood so you can see I'm not really particularly worrying about going over the edge the colours are very close in tone. Um, that's why I've gone for these colours, so you get in a build-up of, of layers and patterners. Remember how, it, how the piece started. It had patterner, so we, we're probably going to put dark wax or maybe even a wash of en fleur into the corbels to add real depth inside there. So we're going to literally we'll paint some of this corbel, and you can see also this strip, I'm going to take my time and go over the edge of this strip and the top in olive. So, as you can see, I'll work through this progress and I'll stop and you'll be able to see when I've got the next coat on. 
I'm loving the colour combination, it's working really well. So let's talk about this fine edge. This fine edge I'm having to cut, cut in against my other colour, so I'm using an artist brush. Now this artist brush has got a slight bevel, a beveled edge on it. it, it kind of shaped like that and I find this really easy for cutting in so you can push your brush up against the line. So let's give it a go, a little bit here and I'm just literally loading my brush up and pushing it into the, the groove and just taking. Now if you want this to be run smoother you may need to um, just spritz it with a little bit of water to loosen your paint. It, it'll, it will flow much easier but I'm going straight from the can on, onto this plate which is thickened up quite a lot but I don't mind that because I'm quite used to the paint. Um, I like my paint to go slightly thicker um, and so I'm just literally pushing into that edge neat enough. I'm going to do the same on the top and paint the top. It requires a steady hand and a good eye but it's well worth the effort. Sometimes these smaller details just make the biggest of difference. So never worry too much about the connection between the two. The two colours are very close but we may apply some dark wax into this groove so that will hide your wobbly line if you're not so neat. Always take a, a step back at your work. You can see where you've maybe missed areas like here and here. So always give yourself a moment, maybe make a cup of tea and just enjoy what you're doing. So. It really is fine to use a small artist brush just to get into the details, especially on something with lots of detail like this corbel. So I'm pushing the paint into all of its little, little details and to help me guide round the other details, I can just cut in with this little brush. And as you can see, I've also kept the original hardware, so this had a wooden knob on it. And you could change them, but I felt this really suits the piece of furniture. So I'm painting straight over and allowing it to be part of its original features, because I think it really works with the cobalt, the wooden knob. If we'd put some glitzy, something glitzy on there, it kind of jar against it. So we're just gonna keep it. Here we are, we've got the olive on and it, to me it looks beautiful and I was going to blend some other tones into it but I'm not going to because I think a bit of wet distressing will do that for me anyway. Currently this paint is still drying, I can feel it, to, to, there's moisture in the, in the paint. So as soon as we add any more moisture to it, the paint's going to become very unstable. Um, I like a challenge, so this is why I'm going to do this in front of the camera with you. And we're just going to distress it a little bit back to uh, the timber underneath. And hopefully we'll get a few flecks of the Paris grey. Um, maybe not, because the two layers of paint were painted quite soon after each other. So ordinarily, that base coat at the beginning, you would really need to give it a day of drying time to get that jewel toned um, distressed look. Or if you fancied showcasing a little bit more of your underpainted colour, in this case Paris Grey, and wanted a little bit more of that to show, you could randomly wax certain areas pre-painting the olive and the chateau and then when you move on to the wet distressing it would allow that to be a little bit more of a hero. So take out is much moisture out of your rag and we'll just slowly, I'm going to come under here and I'm going to work around here because this is where we would get an awful lot of distressing so we're just going to kind of knock it a little bit, the handle, we'll play with the handle first and we're just going to use it like, like you're cleaning a baby's face, just gently and circular motions, oh we have got a little bit of Paris Grey, that's quite nice, we can see down here and we're just going to work on this leading edge and bring some of it back and just gently soften it in. We're going to plenty down here. You can always do a lot of distressing at the bottom because what would happen to the piece of furniture? It would get kicked over the years 
and oh look at that that's just gorgeous in there we've got a lovely section of where the paris grays come back so on any raised area we're going to go for there we go look beautiful so basically it will distress it off the paint will find the thicknesses where we added it thick and thin it will find its own distressing level the core ball this will be fun so gently does it we're going to take a little bit off we just want to try and get a little bit of the paris gray back on any of the high ground lovely and we're going to probably put some dark wax in this as well deep into the crevices so that's all we're going to and also another little technique once you've had the moisture get a dry cloth and we can just slightly soften and that softens it brings it gently to the surface the other colors so I'm quite happy with that. We'll just come, we'll do a little bit more on here. Can you see? Just gently does it. So, and keep on standing back. You'll always need to look at what you're doing. I feel like it needs a bit more distressing here. Only a little bit. So use your cloth as a tool both hands and I'm not going to do too much distressing up here just maybe a little bit on this top rim but not a lot because what would get in there nothing would get in there so use your brain to think about where distressing might happen it's a logical sort of thing a sense that you have to have when doing this so gently just blend that away at the top so we've got a little bit nice around the edges so I'm happy with that and a little bit down here. I'm nearly at the final stage of my distressing part and I'm super thrilled with how it's come out. It's, it's coming off perfectly. Um, but what I do want to show you is I'm gonna purposely make a, a mistake in the piece what I will see as a mistake. So I'm gonna really take away maybe an area that's too much and you just think, oh no, that just is just far too much distressing. If you make that mistake, and I have done it in other areas, you can kind of pick up your base color, a little bit of paint on it, and we can kind of just soften it out a little bit and blend it away until you get a little, let me move these out of the way so you can see. So you can see, see there, I've just kind of softened it out and allowed it, because the paint's still wet, so we're adding wet on wet. Just make sure you don't go back in that area, because look, it does come straight off. So if you don't like something, just pick up a tiny little bit of paint. There's moisture in there, so we don't want to add too much moisture, but just kind of feather it out. So like that, and you can always, if you kind of think, oh, I want a bit more distress, let it dry and then come back to it. So that's a little cheat for, when you feel like you might have gone too far with something. Um, but I do like a bit of heavy distressing on the corners because that's where it would naturally get its own wear and tear. So, and obviously all along the edges of doors and handles, we're putting the moisture back in. We'll go over the corbel. So rubbing away on the corbel, you can, these are beautiful because they've got a soft curve to them. So you are really getting to see some of the Paris grey on there. It's beautiful. Um, a little bit along this trim as well, I think. Not, not too much up here again, just maybe a little bit in the corners. I've got a chipped bit of veneer there, so I might make something of that piece. Um, and back down the other side. And we've got another little trick for these centre panels, which you're going to see in the next part of the tutorial once this is all complete. Now we're at the very final touches and I want to use my favourite technique which is fly spec. Um, and how we're going to do this, we're going to mix up a colour because I don't want the colour to be too dark and I don't want it to be too light. So I've decided to go with a mix of what we've already been using. We're going to use a little bit of olive, not much, so we're going to add a little bit of olive to the bowl and to darken it up we're going to, I'm going to use graphite. 
So we're looking for a muddy colour. Um, and this should be a little bit more graphite. Mixed in a bit. Oh, and I need to talk about the brush. Fly spec brush. This is a cheap artist br brush. The bristles are quite um, strong and bristly. And all I've done is taken a little bit off the top. You might want to play around with this by cutting certain brushes down. Certain brushes will do it really well and soft brushes probably won't do it very well. So that's your key, one of your key tools. Um, and m the right consistency of paint. Now, th this is why I've brought this piece of card here so we can practice run. Don't go straight for your piece because if it's too wet and it's horizontal, it will run down and you'll be like, oh no, all of my work and I've ruined it. So you've got to be really careful what you do with this. So you can see I'm adding water with my spritzer because I don't want to add too much water. It's about, it's, it's really difficult to put an amount. It's always about feel with these things. So I've got sort of a, a grayy, olivey color going on in the bowl and it needs to be really well mixed. Let me have a feel. I can kind of, it kind of just wants to fall off the brush. That might be still a little bit too thick, but I'm going to give it a, a, a try on the card before we go anywhere near the piece. And hopefully I won't flick it too far up onto the piece, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. So here goes. Let's move these things out of the way. And you take the residue away from the brush, so you've just got a little bit of paint in there. And all you do is take your forefinger and pull back the bristles and let them twang back at the area you want to work on, which should hopefully splatter these little tiny holes. So here goes nothing. It's kind of there, I feel. It probably, let me add, add a bit more paint. See if it's enough. Yeah, well, look, there we go. I'm happy. It's probably the right amount. So my paint, if I can kind of show, it's kind of like that much. It's really difficult to show you on camera, but it probably had about three or four spritzes of water just to loosen it. So here goes, we're gonna move on by putting the fly spec into certain areas on the piece. Before you start flicking your fly spec over your piece, what I would ask you to do really is to stand back and think about this really logically. You don't want the whole piece to be covered in this. And a good indication of where it might look good to use this is where we've got more distressing marks. So I would probably just do this corner down here and maybe a little bit up here and a, a little bit there and maybe a small fraction here, but leave large areas that are free of it. And the best thing for you to do is go round the back of the piece to start, till you get the feel of how this, this works. So I'm gonna start deep in here and work to my front area because I, don't, I want to make my mistakes where they won't be seen. Or if you're very nervous about adding your fly spec over your paint finish that you've created, you could wax the whole piece with clear wax at this stage, allowing you freedom to remove any of the fly spec by wiping away with a damp cloth. Once all is dried, you can then give the whole piece another quick clear coat of wax, allowing the fly spec to be sealed in on the piece. Now, fly spec to me is, it imitates sort of woodworm holes. So I'm kind of, that's why I'm imitate, imitating sort of the it, random patches because it would never be over the whole piece. It's just in separate areas. So this is why we're going to make it a little bit random in its pattern. I'm gonna probably go up here and around here. So I'm getting brave at this point. And we're gonna allow it to come across that corbel and I'm happy with that. Also, you may find if you're a glasses wearer like me, you'll get some back spray, which you might want to clear the, the paint from your glasses before you move on. Um, and look, it's flicked up there. I'm quite happy with that, just a small amount. I'm gonna make it heavier down here. You'll notice it shows more over 
the paler areas. It's all about angling your brush the right way. Occasionally, you'll get one of these fly specks that looks a little bit like a flying saucer and it's elongated in its shape. And if you don't like it, what you can do is very carefully just take a bit of cloth, um, spritz it, and literally just dab it onto the mark, lift it a little bit, and then kind of pat it around. And what, what you'll do is you'll make a raise it, but you need to pat around the edges. And it, especially on this, it's got lots of different tones, so it's gonna disguise it really well. There's probably, there was one there that I wasn't very keen on. There's one up here. So again, I'm just gonna clean part of the cloth where it's a bit, a bit of moisture in it, just dab, move the cloth, and then you can kind of slightly rub, but very gently, and then dab around it. Because what you'll do is you'll remove some of the tone around it. So you have to be really careful not to take too much out. There's another one there that looks a little bit rogue. So we're gonna take that one out. And a bit more moisture. So dab it around. You've got this cloudy thing going on with this um, technique anyway, so it will hide it very well. And there's a little one there that I'm not very clean, keen on. And they should dry out lovely. So that's what you can do if you're not happy with the odd one, the rogue ones. So um, I'm, I'm gonna add a little tiny bit more to this bottom corner, because I, I really do like my fly spec to be quite heavy. And then we're gonna go up here, right underneath this corbel, I think. The woodworm has traveled on its holidays up to this top section. And I'm really happy with that. Here we go, I'm super pleased. I could not tell you how happy I am with the outcome of this. So all that's left to do is add a little bit of dimension using dark wax, but first, of course, we have to use clear wax. So the whole piece is gonna be covered with clear wax in preparation to just add a little dimension of dark wax into any of the details, including these beautiful corbels, to really bring this piece to life. So let's go for it. Um, we're just gonna add a small amount of wax. I'm cross hatching with the wax brush. Um, and I'm also using the, the brush, Annie's brushes are pointed. So rather than going straight in flat and doing this, you really want to be going up and down, up and down, because you want to keep that point on the brush. You don't want to wear the bristles away. So it's really nice to kind of do long movements with the brush back and forth, back and forth like that, rather than um, going because mm -mm -mm, you're going to wear that brush away quicker and that point is there for a reason. Hence the corbels. You can push wax into details when you need to with the point. So that helps. That point helps get into all of those lovely details. So if you notice, I'm always kind of bringing the brush back and forward in those sort of movements. So use your wrist back and forward. And what you can also see is the colours. When the wax hits the colours, it really comes to life. Um, and, and a lot of people don't like waxing, but for me, it's the, my very favourite uh, part of the whole process because all of that hard work, you're getting to see it inch by inch come, come back to life. So don't despair when it comes to waxing, just enjoy it. So that's that panel done. And all I'm gonna do, is uh, take a lint-free cloth just to take off any excess. And that's all you really need to do with the waxing. And once we've covered the whole piece, we will go to adding the dark wax. I finished with the clear wax, but what I've done, I decanted a little out from the can into here because we don't want to contaminate the two. And this is my eraser. So if I've got anything that 
I'm really not sure about. I can dip into here with a, a large wax brush and take it away. So first things first, I've got a variety of brushes that I like to wax with when I'm just doing detailed work. So small artistry brushes, maybe even your, um, if you've got one, a stencil brush can be quite useful. So all I'm gonna do is pick up a little bit of dark wax straight from the can. I'm gonna work to this, the, the aperture of this framing and we're just gonna push some wax into those details. And all we're doing is creating a shadow really. So up to the top, into the detail. And I'm pushing certain areas a little bit more like here and a little bit there and down. So, and then if I want to kind of soften it out, I'm taking my wax brush with a bit of clear wax on. I'm just gonna go in a circular motion around that area and soften it out. Use the cloth and you can just slightly soften that in and erase it in. So you're adding sort of, I don't know, the, the darkness into the, where dust and things would gather over its lifetime. And it also gives it that dimension. So just slowly work around. We'll, I'm gonna to move to the corbel because this is an interesting area. All of these sort of crevices, we want to fill with the dark wax. So I can be a little bit heavier about this underneath there and it will pop and come to life. So don't be frightened of the dark wax. Apply it into all of the detailed areas. And you, with your small brush, along these edges as well, because it would all gather in there and it would probably sit on that, that little lip. Just take your time over it. And it would maybe gather underneath up the top. So we'll allow it to be there. Really, all you have to do is make sure you get it into the crevices, really. So yeah, it might look a little bit messy, but we're gonna pick up some clear again and just go over it, just to soften. And that'll give you the freedom to take away anything that you, you're not keen on. So if you bring that, off. And you don't want to rub right into the crevices again. You want to leave it there. So that's, you're just taking off the high ground and leaving into the low ground. And let me stand a little bit away. I'm quite happy with that. It's just a hint of tone. I'm really happy with that. A little bit, see, I'm going to add a little bit under here and probably a little bit round this handle. We'll carry on down into that corner. There you go, you can see now we have that little bit of dimension to these panels. Um, I may also go on the opposite side of the panel above there because that might gather some sort of dirt in that area. Quite like that. So it's just adding another dimension. I hope you can see the difference between the two on the camera. We will do close-up shots of this at the end so you can really see the difference in the dimension with the wax. It really does make a difference. So I'm gonna carry on with the whole process. We're gonna also do in here and in, in this crevice as well. Anywhere you think dust or dirt might gather, that's the places to use your dark wax. I'm also gonna do a little bit underneath. I just want that dimension, but not as much. And maybe come down a little bit. It's just, it's highlighting and toning and all I'm gonna come through is with the clear wax, use it as an eraser again. Just take most of the top part off and a little bit off the bottom. And we just take that back. And that should help you. People are very frightened of dark wax. And so I this is how I like to use it. I'm using two things at once, I'm using 
the clear wax to a raise and it also adds a little bit of tone and dimension but also the dark wax just in the areas I want it to be in so I hope you can see Always remember, erase your dark wax with some clear wax. Never be afraid of dark wax. Look at the results. I think they speak for themselves. I couldn't be more happy with this piece and I'm really looking forward to you seeing it in its own room setting. So for now, it's a wrap. <laughs>